When an industrial oil spill devastates the Gulf Coast, fishermen from the small Texas town of Palacios are recruited to help clean up the waters. One of the fishermen suffers an unfortunate accident, leaving him disillusioned with his life. But things change when he encounters something supernatural washed up on the poisoned coast. In Palacios, Texas, a man drives with an oil-covered bird in his passenger seat. He takes it to a courier service to ship it to a company called Titan International in New York City. At the attendant's query, the man, half his face covered in scars, opts for regular delivery time to let the carcass decay further. A while back, Titan International was responsible for spilling oil on the Gulf Coast severely affecting the fishing town of Palacios. On the radio, Senator Dorsey condemns Titan and assures the listeners that he's helping everyone affected by the disastrous spill. Despite these words, the fisherman's livelihood has been critically disrupted, with expeditions yielding nothing but oil-slicked abominations. Later, a couple of patrons in a dive bar order drinks when the scarred man staggers inside, dragging an oxygen tank. One of the patrons explains to a kid how the man fell into the oil spill while cleaning up dizzy from the airborne dispersant. The man now needs an oxygen tank to help him breathe, in addition to the scarring caused by the mix of oil and the dispersant's chemicals. Afterward, a fisherman regales the patrons with a story about encountering several mermaids at sea. He claims to have been bitten several times until one of his companions scared the creatures off with gunfire. He even lifts his shirt to show the grotesque bite marks in response to one skeptical patron. One of the fishermen, Howler, tells the others that his son will be joining him as a deckhand for the opening of the fishing season. A drunk deckhand called Breezy offers advice to the youngster, but another fisherman makes fun of him. The fisherman who told the story about mermaids asks the scarred man Sharko if he'll be there for the opening, but Sharko says no. Howler explains the nickname to his kid, detailing how the man rips fish out of the ocean like a great white shark. Breezy carelessly comments on Sharko's accident, but one of the men pushes him to leave, causing a brief scuffle. Sharko grumbles about the obvious lack of viable catch due to the spill's lingering effects. He also believes the cleanup efforts are a sham, seeing how the chemical dump did more harm than good. One man offers Senator Dorsey's claim of cleaned up waters, but Sharko opines that it's a publicity stunt to further Dorsey's political ambitions. Later, Sharko sits in his pickup, crying bitterly over his situation, when Breezy shows up and knocks on the car window. Breezy makes a callous reference to Sharko's condition before asking to borrow the latter's boat for the season's opening. Sharko refuses, recalling how Breezy was so unreliable as a deckhand. He rolls up his window and leaves the man seething. After a sleepless night, Sharko turns on his CB radio and hears Howler remarking how beautiful the day is at sea, prompting him to turn the thing off. At the beach later that day, Sharko hears a strange screeching noise coming from somewhere along the coast. He tracks down the source of the sound and comes across a mermaid lying face down on some rocks, covered in dark oil. Sharko drives away with the mermaid in his truck bed, then drags the creature to his home afterward. While the CB radio blares the fisherman reporting mutated catch, Sharko dumps the mermaid's motionless body into his bathtub filled with ice. As he celebrates his extraordinary catch, the phone rings. The caller is someone from a law firm, informing Sharko that a class action lawsuit is representing victims of the Titan oil spill a year ago, which includes him. Sharko, however, slams the phone down. That night, as Sharko downs several cans of beer, he hears a sound coming from his bathroom. He cautiously peeks around the door and sees the mermaid squirming in the tub, at which point she spots him and lets out an ear-splitting shriek. Sharko retrieves a rifle from his truck and points it at the open bathroom door, but the mermaid, who's now on the floor, disarms him and knocks him into the tub. As Sharko tussles with the creature, he gets bitten on on the arm but manages to restrain the mermaid with a net and dumps her back in the bathtub. He recovers the rifle and points its barrel down the mermaid's head, but her expression, coupled with some strange visions, calms him down. The next day, Sharko buys some meat from the supermarket. Back home, he removes oil from the mermaid's gills to help her breathe. He also cuts out the net around her mouth, then makes her choose between the steak and haddock. The mermaid gestures toward the steak, and Sharko carefully feeds her the raw meat, saying he'll be back for supper. That night, as Sharko watches an old show, he feels a strange sensation beckoning him to the bathroom. Bathroom. So, he puts the TV in front of the bathtub and watches the show with the mermaid still wrapped in the net. He makes small talk, telling the creature about the classic show playing on the tube. He recites the romantic dialogue of the characters, commenting that his father learned English by watching American TV. Sharko eventually falls asleep, but as the mermaid reaches for his neck, he wakes up to a strange noise and gets up to investigate. Sharko catches Breezy inside his house, trying to steal his radio. He confronts Breezy, who makes a few feeble excuses until Sharko threatens to call the cops. Breezy throws the radio in frustration and backs Sharko toward the bathroom with taunts and threats. Breezy hears a noise from the bathroom, pushes Sharko aside, and finds the mermaid in the bathtub. While Breezy
CC greedily speculates about selling the creature, Sharko intends to return her back to the ocean once the water clears. Breezy then comments that keeping a mermaid in a tub isn't feasible, with a knowing look in his eye. Days later, Breezy finishes building a large, makeshift water tank for Sharko inside the house. Sharko picks at Breezy's handiwork, sharing how his father taught him to take pride in his craft. Breezy retorts that his father was abusive and shows the cigarette burn scars on his abdomen. He now revels in the fact that he's seen an actual mermaid. Sharko asks Breezy not to tell anyone about the mermaid since she's their catch. He resorts to flattery, recalling their working history as a captain and deckhand. Breezy balks at the analogy, but Sharko claims his harsh treatment was of a parental nature. Echoing his relationship with his father, Sharko continues to flatter Breezy, who thinks the callous words he received were lessons in disguise. Sharko leans into the gullible man's train of thought, convincing him to keep their secret with affectionate words. They soon put the mermaid into the tank, and Sharko watches fondly. That night, Sharko prepares a steak dinner for him and the mermaid. He cheerfully recalls his father's soft spot for American culture, including TV shows, cars, and girls. Sharko remembers his father's arrival as an immigrant causing a stir in Palacios. It reached a point where extremist elements came to his father's house, intending to push him out of their livelihood. His father, however, defied those people with the threat of his rifle. Just then, the mermaid seems to emit a song-like sound. Sharko admits to struggling with life since the oil spill accident, saying how his loss is also his father's in a way. Sharko notes how comfortable he is talking to the mermaid, and as they make eye contact, he sees quick visions of him getting intimate with an unknown woman. His thoughts are interrupted by a knock on the door, and upon opening it, he sees an attractive woman standing there. The woman calls Sharko by his last name, Peters, and claimed he saved her life on the beach. She walks into the house past a confused Sharko, touches the empty makeshift tank, and sits on an armchair. As the woman recalls the last story Sharko was telling just a few moments ago, Sharko realizes that his mysterious guest is the mermaid in human form. The woman tells Sharko that she carries a message of thanks from the sea itself. As opposed to the irresponsible oil companies and greedy politicians, only Sharko understood just how terrifying the spill was. The woman then tells him he's one of them, having salt water in his blood. He removes Sharko's oxygen tube and tells him to breathe, then heals his scarred face with a caress of her hand. The woman recalls how people thought Sharko fell into the water, but she thinks he was just looking for her. She kisses Sharko, who sheds tears of joy. Afterward, Sharko and the woman dance happily to a song, proceeding to make love on the couch. Then, he entertains her with the story of how he got the name Sharko due to a feat of fishing that earned him significant money. The woman sympathizes with Sharko's difficulties and also affirms his beliefs about the cleanup mess and Senator Dorsey. The two recreate a romantic dialogue between characters from a show they watched. Sharko then admits wishing that he drowned when he fell off the boat, seeing how his survival merely caused him constant pain. The woman kisses him as comfort. Later, Sharko sees a car arrive in front of his house, leaving the worried woman inside to check it out. Outside, Howler and a group of fishermen, including Breezy, greet Sharko, who appears to have reverted to his injured state. Howler admits their fishing ventures have been in vain and that Sharko was right about Senator Dorsey being unhelpful. When Howler asks if Sharko is really keeping a mermaid, the latter venomously calls out Breezy for snitching on him. Sharko refuses Howler's insinuation that he hand over the mermaid for the fishermen to make money off of. Howler points out that he and the other men have families to feed, but Sharko counters that it's not his problem. Howler gets aggressive, saying Sharko doesn't need the mermaid since he was paid handsomely for the botched cleanup job. Sharko maintains his refusal at first, but after exchanging tense glances with the men surrounding him, he relents and goes back to the house. Sharko soon returns with his rifle and threatens the fishermen to get off his lawn. The men back away nervously as one of them appeals to his good nature. Sharko retorts that a visit in the dead of night in greater numbers hardly counts as friendly. Breezy accuses Sharko of bluffing, but the latter fires around close to Breezy's feet, causing him to scream in shock. Sharko reloads and promises to kill every last one of the men, proclaiming himself king of the ocean and defending the mermaid in his possession. So, Howler gives up and beckons the rest of the men to get back in their trucks to leave. Sharko goes back inside wheezing, as the woman seems to speak inside his head, asking if the fishermen have left. He assures the mermaid, who's now back in the tank, and invites her for a dip in the ocean. The mermaid watches Sharko intently, projecting illusions in his mind that he's out enjoying the sun and salty breeze. He climbs up the tank with a ladder and extends his hand to the mermaid. In Sharko's mind, he and the mermaid's human form are jumping off a dock for a swim. The mermaid pulls Sharko into the tank, and he submerges with a contented expression. As he flashes back to the false imagery of his time with the woman, the mermaid devours Sharko, and his blood blossoms under the water. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.